So let's go on substitution principle. Um, how many people here have heard of it before? Good. How many people remember it, think they remember it reasonably well? Couple, couple. Uh, okay, so so that's good. I think for those who re remember it reasonably well, um, you'll hopefully this will be confirmatory. Maybe the words, the ways in which I explain it will be different from when you first heard. Where did you hear about it? 370? Yeah. Okay. Um, so just like last semester. So hopefully it's pretty familiar to, to all those. Uh, two years ago. <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> what? Two years ago. Two years from me, not after. Two, two years? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. So the basic idea here concerns the height and concerns um, a class, the, the subtype of, or excuse me, it doesn't have to be a class, it's yeah, some type that's a subtype of another. This could be a class, D could be a class, C could be a class, or D could be a class and C could be an interface, or D could be an interface and C could be an interface. Um, and you know we have methods uh, which are in uh, in in this class C, or which operate on things of this class C. And uh, yet, because of subtyping, we can pass things that are D's around. So here we all see the new D, right? I don't know, right? And we pass it as if it were a C. So, so this would be familiar. And then polymorphism, the idea is dividing a subtype, like a B is a subtype of C, I can pass B around as if it were a C, right? Here I'm passing the D, I'm writing the side of call of foo as if it were a C. Now, this code at the left apparently doesn't know that D is the pattern. All it knows is. And don't pass this here, right? But as we say informally, you might say every D is a C, right? So it can be passed around as if it were a C. To be familiar to you with basic ideas of sub of polymorphism and subtyping, right? Okay. So just to kind of get us on the same page here. Um, so the list of substitution principle is about using this ability safely. Okay, it's about guaranteeing that the promises made by these classes are compatible. And particularly for, for recognizing a legitimate relationship between D and C. In other words, there are times where people use subtyping as, and particularly in the form of subclassing, as kind of an implementation thing. So C can inherit things from C. Without it really being the subtype, without it being safe to pass around a D to pass around as if it were a C. And the Liskov substitution principle is guidelines for how for for how to use this safe and reflects any reason safely about types in the presence of this thing called morphism, where we in other words, where we can pass around like a D as if it were a C. This polymorphism imposes uh, responsibilities on us. And the same on the principle, which is due to Barbara Liskov to that point, uh, is let okay. So suppose that we have F that's a subtype of T, okay? So F is, is every F is a T, is a comfortable phrase that also gets really fine. And let let's go back to something that we can that we can guarantee approval that any T passes some problems and to some guarantee. We'll talk about the concrete example. Then the same, whatever we can prove about a T, we need to be able to prove for an X. We need to be able to, to ensure stays true for an X. If X is a subtype, or here, if D is a subtype of C, anything that we can Guarantee for a C, a true blue C, has got to also hold for a D. Okay, 
It's got to hold. We have to be able to assume it for a D because it can be passed to us without us knowing that it's a D. And if we can't count on all the properties of a C, we'll treat it like a C and it could blow up in our face because we're counting on those properties that secretly is the D. That's sort of the core idea. So subtypes here have to maintain guarantees that someone could infer from the supertype, could infer from here. If looking at this, this interface or class, they can come up with some interpretation. It's like, oh, it's immutable. What do I mean by immutable? Anyway. Yes, there we go. Can't change it, but I can't change it. The Z needs to be immutable too. Or else they can be brutally surprised. They their code could break because they're counting on it being immutable. If C is something, whoa, uh, if C is something that guarantees uh, that some counter is always greater than zero um, after it's initialized, D needs to be able to count on that uh, on that as well. So anything that you could reasonably infer from this needs to hold true for that is the idea. Okay, so um, the idea is suppose you're a developer creating code whose apparent type is T1, that's, that's uh, this one. Um, uh, and the actual type is T2. So the actual type is a D here. The apparent type is a C. Is that language okay for you? This is the apparent type for this code. It's, it's a C, but the actual type is a D. Hmm? Um, so it's in order to avoid every new subtype of C from breaking this code, from causing... I need to update this code. You need to be able to reason about these all these subtypes as if they were a C legitimately. In other words, uh, make sure the same properties are guaranteed. Otherwise, it may break it. Now, this sounds restricted, but it's really just uh, uh, the point is that well, if, if all you know, if all this code knows is this is a C. It needs to be able to count on all those properties of being a C. It has no idea what subtype it is. Subtypes could have been added since this code was created, right? Could have added D, could have added E, could have added F. And yet when this person wrote this code, they knew C's guarantee these things. C's are immutable. So they could be writing code that counts on that. And we have to ensure that their code doesn't break every time you know we add some some uh subtype so we need the subtypes to be to be consistent right if a subtype breaks these assumptions errors and rework bugs result okay so let's, let's talk about a, a few key points for a flight um interface specification like the specification of an interface of a class or, or a, a Java or C sharp interface, or what have you. These are contracts, and it's it's fruitful often to think about them as contracts. I know T3 um, made reference to uh, this repository pattern, which was uh, noting the importance of contract based design. And when this team said that they were making use of contract based design, my heart sank. Okay, um, in general, interfaces are fruitful to look at it as a contract. And people count on these specifications. So the user of the instances of a class count on the property, count on the, the guarantee, the contract insured by that by that function. And people who create subtypes of this class also uh, will be reasoned about counting on these characteristics. Um, and it turns out that uh, there's issues with superclasses who won't get into here as well. Um, now, if you don't provide clear guarantees for what this class uh, ensures, then it actually worsens the problem because the, the promises are not clear. And someone using it won't know if certain things are guaranteed. And they may just guess. Okay. Um, 
So here we're going to be dealing with the promises made by a class we're going to, or an interface. We won't be dealing here with, with implementation issues, which are going to be matters uh, that we'll have in a separate lecture. Okay, I want to talk about server contracts. Okay, um, as a metaphor for this, um, so you folks are familiar with the idea of a delivery server. You've all heard of FedEx or Perlator Courier, um, these uh, UPS, right? These these courier services. Um, and let's say FedEx. Um, FedEx. Has, is the delivery, you know, it provides the delivery infrastructure and service, but it has franchise. What do I mean by franchise? Anyone want to say what's a franchise? So I said, oh, my friend set up a FedEx franchise. Yeah, but that's right. That's right. So there might be uh, a franchise uh, in Saskatoon in that, that, puts up the FedEx label, they hang a single with, with a FedEx sign. It says they are FedEx, but they're locally owned, right? But they are able to make use of FedEx's software maybe for maintaining package delivery, FedEx's planes that they use to fly packages worldwide, um, FedEx's customer support number, FedEx's forms, all that sort of stuff, right? Those envelopes. Um, so if we think about a delivery service like again, these franchises, which are analogous to subtypes of FedEx, what do they need to guarantee? So suppose the, the parent company here, FedEx, requires users, customers, to drop off packages by noon. So what I want to ask you is, so suppose I set up a FedEx franchise. I, maybe it's maybe Fred sets up a, 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 a franchise for FedEx. He likes to call it FredX, but it, it has FedEx's logo on it. There are FedEx enterprise. And FedEx, you know, is what drops, which allows package or requires packages for delivery the next day. To be dropped off by noon, the previous day, right? Um, so you have to say, you drop off by noon, I can get anywhere in Canada by 5 p.m. that I get. What could FedEx allow? What could, what could the franchise that FedEx allow? Could it allow, for example, a customer to, could it require a customer to drop off a package before 11 a.m.? Could a customer be disappointed? If they walk in, if a customer looks at the FedEx website and they see as a general rule for FedEx, you have to drop off packages by noon for delivery anywhere in Canada. And they say, oh, looks good. Um, I'll get it into there before my lunch break tomorrow. And they drive it over there before noon. And they walk into FedEx, that's the answer. And FedEx says, oh, well, we actually require it by, by 11 a.m. Could that person be upset? Yeah, they could be upset. They could be disappointed. They say, well, wait a minute. I saw on the, web, on the website that you will not have to get it by noon. But here it is. It's, it's only 1130, and you're telling me you don't accept it? What's wrong with you? You're not FedEx. You're a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> Now, but with FedEx, so, so that's not the question. FedEx can't make it more restrictive. They can't say, well, we require it by 11 and a half. Um, that would be contrary to FedEx's rules the, for, for, for uh, what they require. Um, it would not be competitive. Could FedEx allow package? So, by contrast, if FedEx said, Look, um, FedEx requires a buy but we're not going to allow you to take it as long as you get it here by, you know, 5 p.m. the previous day. We'll allow that because we have our own private plane that we can fly and we'll get it to Is that okay? Yeah. yeah, it is. It's okay. That's, that's fine. They're living within every package that would be, so 
considered legit by FedEx rules would be legit. It gets in by there, no problem. But they'll accept something more general, right? Or lax. They'll be more lax. Do you understand that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, so that's exactly right. They, um, uh, you know, uh, it's okay if the if the um if the franchise allows looser rules here, but um, they can't be more restrictive, right? They can be less restrictive than the pre -kinetic. They they can allow more packages to be delivered uh, by by allowing them up to three p.m. Handle more cases. For the post condition, suppose that FedEx guarantee and on their website it says. As long as you get the package by the end, we guarantee it will be delivered by 5 p.m. the next day. Um, yes, uh, Ernest. Yeah, we're, we're going to come to that. Yeah, yeah we're, we have lots of examples of that. And we'll talk about it. So, so how about for the post condition? So, for the post condition, if, if FedEx says, we'll guarantee your package is there by 5 p.m., is it okay for FedEx that someone, if a customer walks in having seen the FedEx website, knowing they, they go to the condition, this is FedEx I'm going to, and they come into FedEx, and FedEx says, well, actually, we don't care if FedEx to guarantee 5 p.m., we, we guarantee for the delivery of, you know, that it will be delivered by 9 p.m. FedEx. Is that okay? No, the customer will say, You're not FedEx. You're on. <laughs> That's right. Uh, could they, by contrast, could again the post condition say, We'll guarantee delivery by 3 p.m. because we have Santa on our side and he'll fly it across the country? Yeah, yeah, they could. Um, uh, so it's okay if they provide. A, a more restrictive, a stronger guarantee for the post -kidding. Okay, so let's let's talk about this contract part. Okay, here's that. Where, where the pre-condition and post -kidding. Here's uh, a franchise, right? Um, a franchise one. It says package, it'll allow package available by three p.m. That's less restrictive than that. Okay. Um, and a post condition is delivered by noon the next day. Is that okay, franchise, franchise one? It allows the pre condition is looser than this one here. It allows more, it'll handle more cases. And it guarantees something that's stricter than this one here. It guarantees that it will, it guarantees that it will get there by noon the next day. So it's a the subset of what this guarantee for this is within that guarantee. Is that okay? It is. Yeah, someone who thinks all they know is that it's a, uh, uh, a FedEx. They think of the upper FedEx franchise one, they're sweating bullets because they have to get in by 12 noon, and and uh, that, that works fine with this, right? They get in by 12 noon, it works fine with FedEx franchise one. And the, what's guaranteed by FedEx is also insured by this one, right? This one doesn't need bigger guarantee. You know, it is uh, uh, Rudolph and Blitzen, so I, you know, flying a sled, but it guarantees that it's about FedEx post to so, uh, so it's available, so the precondition is that it's available by 12 noon, and the package is delivered by noon the next day. Is that okay? Yeah, it is. Just fine. Okay, so let's let's continue to go. So there's a couple of corollaries to this. One is the method signature uh, compatibility. Some languages allow this, and I want to I want to um, allow variability in what the methods take as um, in terms of types for the parameter types and for the return values and the exceptions. And I want to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about behavior. Okay, we're going to use a language. We're going to call a, a type T1, equally or more restrictive than another one. If every concrete object can be represented as a T1, can be represented by a T2. So an example here is string is more restrictive than object, right? Um, so T1 here is string, uh, and T2 um, uh, is, is object. Okay, so 
uh, right, so a T1 uh, string is more restrictive than object here. Uh, every object that we represented by string can also, it is, is a legitimate object, right? Okay. Um, and if T1 is a subtype of T2, the idea is T1 should be equally or more restrictive than T2. String is more restrictive than this. Okay. So let's talk about parameters here, okay? Subtypes have to have method signatures compatible with, sub, uh, with supertypes. And the idea here is that the parameter types can be no more restrictive than those of the supertypes. They can only weaken the condition, just like the franchise. The franchise for its precondition can allow packages later to weaken the condition, right? It can accept more conditions, have less restrictive conditions. That's analogous to this. The preconditions can be weakened, um, but the return types are more restrictive. Okay, um, and same thing with exceptions. Let's go in and look at some examples. Okay, so here's our super type, and we have a bunch of subtypes here. So the super type is it has some method process. It takes the string and returns it first. Could you have legitimately a subtype that takes an object, it allows you to give an object. It will accept an object. It will so we get the precondition to accept an object. It doesn't it, it's not for sticking you about identity to be a string. So accept any object and it will return a string. Um and it and it can throw an exception that the subtype is accepted. Is that okay? It is. Yeah, because anyone could anyone could call this legitimate subtype with a script. Well, handle the handle the string, uh, and and it returns the string. So the thing that gets back and it could throw an exception, but that exception is guaranteed to be a exception. That makes sense. Let's talk about so this uh, the subtype up here. So so this one is exactly the same. Subtype itself, right? A lot of languages have traditionally required a subtype to have exactly the same signature, but some languages like to be loose. And let's talk about uh, these subtypes. Suppose that you had a subtype, it, it claimed to be a subtype of my supertype, but and you can pass in a string, but it returns any object. The return to the return of the job, don't you can return a half to something to return a, you know, a, um, a liquid. Would, would that be okay? No, oh, certainly not. Because someone up here, when they process, process, they call process, they're expecting a stretch. And here, you'd be surprised to get an object, right? You don't have to take it. So that's not okay. It, it can't loosen the constraints on the guarantee. Just like FredEx can't say, oh, well, we don't always deliver your packages by 5 p.m. You can sometimes deliver it by 9 p.m. That's not okay. Loosening the process. Similarly, one that said, I'm a, I'm a super type, my super type. Um, that requires people to pass it a double would not be okay. Because uh, someone to pass it a string is going to be really bright, but it's secretly one of these, and it blows up because if you pass it a double. Um, so that's not okay. How about, how about one of these? It's just the same for this, except it can throw exception two, not merely exception one. Well, in languages that are strict about it, Require declaration, not all two, but those that require declaration of exception. Could this cause a root supply? Is a surprise? Yes, it could, because you can throw an exception too. Because secretly, you call process secretly, you're calling it, you don't know, on my cause on subject, and it throws an exception too. You say, wait a minute, you can't throw an exception one against the languages which require that. And Java has these things called tight, uh, checked expressions, the checked exceptions, right? 
So you can't use them in there. Okay, so that was signature compatibility. A same principle here holds for, for behavior. And I want to go through this. So the idea here is that subtype method must behave like calls to infect the super. Okay. Um, so regardless of whether or not you provide a formal specification that or or an informal specification, method of super type can only weaken or maintain post preconditions. It must handle at least everything handled by the super type. Just like ThreadX must allow you to deliver packages as late as noon. But it could say, well, we'll go the extra mile to deliver as late as three because we have moved off your full display. Right? And, and we'll get it, we'll get it um, there for you anyway. That's okay. Don't no one can say you're a fraud. In fact, they might say you're manifold. Um, but uh they they can't complain, right? Because if you go in by noon, you'll FredX will still accept your package. So they won't be upset. And it must strengthen or maintain post conditions here. So um for all the preconditions permitted by the supertype, the post condition has to be legal, considered legal by the, the supertype. It, it could deliver it, it could guarantee delivery anywhere you can by new tomorrow. What would be compatible with FedEx's promises of delivery of by 5 p.m. So the post condition can be strengthened, can be made more particular, but it has to maintain the constraints laid out by the super type. It's the same basic ideas for the signature rule. Let's, let's talk about it, okay? Um, so we want a visitor to this franchise to rely on the guarantees they have with FedEx. They shouldn't have to know all the quirks, right? Okay, so let's 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 talk about um, talk about these things. Um, the methods super type must behave of the subtypes must be consistent with those of the sub super type. We'll give some examples in a moment, and the the interface must preserve provable properties. Okay, um, so anything that's guaranteed by the super type needs to be guaranteed by the subtype, it needs to hold true. Now there are two things that need to be held hold true besides the behavior of the super method. One is what's called an invariant. This would be something like, it is not true if the super type is always returns, uh, excuse me, it uh, is going to uh, hold at any one time this can only hold non-null values. Um, or all the values in this must be greater than zero. And then there's something called a history property, which is if you compare two times, there's some property guarantee. So for example, it's immutable. Okay. Um, so these are things that a user might count on based on the interface. Okay. Um, so you, for example, you can't add delete to a super type. Uh, excuse me, to a subtype of a supertype supporting only inserts. If a supertype only supports inserts, it never supports deletion. If you have a subtype where you can delete things, could a person who's using that not just taking an answer to a supertype where it can only have conversions that they need to use? Could they be really surprised? If some random subtype allows an elision to turn it out. Yeah, someone could say, well, wait a minute, by the declaration of the super time, this can never happen. How did this thing disappear? It's impossible. And it's just because there's some silly subtype around, it, which is not a legitimate one. Okay, so here, let's look at some examples. These are the sort of examples likely to be on the final. Um, so here's a base type. Okay. Um, so this is the super type. A counter. You have a get and an increment. And notice I deliberately chose an example where this button from list of the 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 list of the
What do you think you're doing? Yeah, it's by one is plausible. Someone might say, well, you know, it's one, but probably it's by one. It's a little bit if vague, right? But so it is with some of our specifications, right? I think I saw some of deliverable three. Uh, or sorry, earlier deliverables. Yeah. Okay. Is this a legitimate subtype? Here, uh, number two is a sub it claims to be a subtype of the same type. And it it has it has an overriding thing, right? Um that doubles it. Is that okay? If 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 I if all I see is a program I'm using this number and and uh, I, I see this declaration up here at the top, and I'm using it, and I call increment. Could I be really surprised? Could I be very surprised? Could I be shocked if I read this and instead I find when I increment it doubles it? Yeah, like I don't expect this, right? This behavior. So you cannot pass this around as if it were this, because it would surprise, it would really surprise someone who's. It could lead to bugs because they think increment is going to increase by one, or maybe it increases it by two each other. I don't know, but probably one. And instead, it doubles it. Would that be wild? Yeah. Okay. How about this one? If I have a counter four subtype and it adds another method, double value, is that okay? It doesn't override this one increment. It just adds another one. It adds a bit of extra functionality. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. All I know is the user of this is what's up here. I don't even know this is this. All I know is it's a comment. I don't even know it's all this, right? If someone else calls it somewhere else in the code, you know, call off with this thing I have, and they know it's a counter for it and double it, and, and then it comes back to me. The value I have when I see it would be something that I can get with this, too. There's no big surprise. Okay. Um, so it shouldn't rudely surprise me. Um, okay, how about this one? Is this a okay subtype? So uh, I, I I sustain with this, but I can start at any. Not just, it doesn't just start at zero. It started at any. Is that is that rudely surprising? Okay. If it started at zero, we want to talk about what happens if it started at zero? There's no way you can start with this. The idea is not. So, so this one could be a heavy loss. It says it's a counter. But it's a, it's like, what the heck? It might be stronger than it, right? Um, and that, that they get a value when it's minus 10. It says there's no way you can get minus 10. What do you mean this is a counter? It's not a counter. It's a fraud, right? Right? Okay. Um, how about this one? Counter five. Decrements. It requires it to be greater than zero, but it can decrement. It can go down. The top one, can it go down? No, it's always just going to be positive. It can't go down. Did this one go down? Yeah. Could someone be surprised? Thinking they have one of these, and instead, and, and they think it's always been commenting, and suddenly they pass it off to someone and somewhere else in the code base, and that's it. They get, it gets, you know, and they fill the reference to it, and they look, oh, no, it's one. Something possible is this possible, not it? And they can be really surprised. Their code could be counting on it never decreasing, right? Okay, let's go through a, a couple more of these. Okay. Two, two doubles this value, right? Um, this one overrides increment. So someone uses it thinking it's a counter and they call increment, right? If some, they're expecting it to increment it by some amount, presumably one, maybe, maybe by two or something. But if it's said that, if, if it's said that doubles it, they're going to be shocked that what the heck? You know, I call an increment on this thing, it's supposed to increment and it's double. Plus, if I call it a zero, I get back zero. 
or day six, six and only go up here. Here, you're adding a method to it, which they don't know. They don't, they don't know that method exists. Any value you can get by doubling it, someone else does know on these kind of forms. To double it, they think you could get it actually with this. So there's nothing that will strike them as impossible here. Someone who expects it to be a counter. Um, everything that this can do, every value we can read here could be reached by this software. I don't know if that helps or Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Uh, it, it adds this to, so all of these are direct subtypes of this, right? So, counter four um, is a subtype of counter. It adds, all it does is add a method that is done, if you call it. But it's not increment. So, someone using it as if it were a counter wouldn't even know about the double value. Now, they might pass it to somewhere else in the code that does. But any any value we get to by down elsewhere the public double the double the double the could have been bought to by here. So when when this one peeps at it, it won't see a weird value. Meanwhile, you know, uh this increment they but now this one, when they call increment, they think it's an increment that doubles that it could be big battle. Code behavior that yes. Yes. Sorry, we're doubling what? Well, doubling is not the same as increment. Most other things, if you double zero, you get zero. Increment should always increase. So, so they're different. And normally we don't talk about, when I say increment, we mean by some fixed amount. Okay, um, so these are bad, you know, bad, bad, bad. These are okay. Um, this one is okay. Um, okay, so you should be asking yourself, is there any way a user of the apparent class, this top one, could be rudely surprised by the behavior of a subclass? Surprised in the sense that something they see, would see from a, a subclass is impossible given the behavioral type, given this, this type up here, it's impossible to get a negative value, for example, right? Um, or it's, uh, or, or you know, you call an increment up here and it does something very, very different. Or it's impossible with this that it would decrease. And suddenly now it's decreasing. Um, and you have to be careful about is a reasoning. I was referring to it, I warned you, it's, it's a glib thing. Um, the, the issue is that you want to be able to ensure that anyone who all they know this is what they're dealing with won't be rudely surprised. So um, uh, let's end with one final example. And I'm going to send you some take And you're going to try to answer them before next time. Okay, suppose this is the subtype. And this is the this part, this is the super type. Uh, the top, this is the subtype. So it's the same as the super type, but it extends it and it adds a reset method. It can reset it to any greater than or equal to zero. It doesn't require you to reset it to something greater than or equal to zero. But if someone using one of these counters, all they know is it's a counter. All they, all they know about is the counter. Maybe their code was written long before this one was created. But they'd be really surprised if if they're past one of these and start using it. They could be really surprised. They wouldn't know to call reset because all they know is not reset, right? They would never know reset exists. But if they pass a reference one of these somewhere else in the code that knows the sequence of the correspondence is. And then that place called reset to make to set a graph state of zero. This person would say, wait, this can decrease. It can never decrease. This is impossible for it to ever decrease. What the heck is going on? The world is falling apart, right? Um, and they can be really surprised if their code can break. Because their code can be something on this never decrease. That it iterates through a loop, but it never goes down. And suddenly it's going down, and maybe the loop never terminates. Or maybe it writes to negative values in an array, in the season array, or what have you. So this 
is not a legitimate subtype. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples for the take of um, how much dual counter and swappable tool. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some ideas of this, but we got a break now. I think I'm meeting with two three. So, uh, yes, we look forward to that. And I'll ask you to do a couple of these as exercises. We'll discuss at class. Thank you.